First of all, Fredericksburg was founded in 1846. Um, in 1842, the Adelsverein organization formed in Prussia for the purpose of sending immigrants to um, somewhere. At first, they weren't sure where they were going to send them. Uh, they thought about sending them uh, to Australia, and some did immigrate to Australia. But the purpose of the Adelsverein was really for the protection of German immigrants to Texas. Uh, in the early part of the 1800s, a lot of people were interested in the area that we live in, Texas. There were lots of publications that circulated around Europe talking about all the wonderful things in Texas. So it was <clears throat> at that point in history in Prussia, following uh, the Napoleonic Wars, things were not very pleasant for a lot of people. There was a problem, they thought, of overpopulation. And so there was a need to look at possible places to send immigrants. So the immigrants, <clears throat> the potential immigrants were promised a lot of things by the Adelsverein. The Adelsverein organization was made up of 40 uh, noble men and one noble woman. It was a stock company. Their idea was that they would uh, send immigrants over, they would provide them land, they were going to have a place to live, they were going to have food for a year, transportation from Prussia over here, over to Texas. And so they were, they were promising a lot. Uh, they promised a lot more than they could deliver, and of course, that's not an uncommon thing. Texas, on the other hand, the Republic of Texas, was very interested in having immigrants arrive as they were needing more people in the state or in the country, the Republic of Texas. <clears throat> so they offered these land grants. Uh, the land grant that the Adelsverein thought they were purchasing was something called the Fisher-Miller Tract. It was all the land between the Colorado River and the Llano River from the, where those two join all the way west to pass San Saba, about four and a half million acres. Each family was to get a section of land, 640 acres. A single individual got half of that, and they were to have that land they were to have transportation from either Antwerp or from Bremen to Texas. Now, <clears throat> their original idea was uh, that this was to be a colony, a German colony, that would separate the Anglos on the east from the Mexicans on the west, and that this eventually was going to be an economic uh, engine for Germany and for the for the people that were sent, the company that was sending these individuals over. The Adels Orion, as I said, was formed in 1842. They made these promises, and in June of 1844, they announced this in the newspapers across Prussia. They had a tremendous response. Uh, something in the order of 15,000 people responded and put up their money to take the contract and to, to come to Texas. Well, they had sent a group of uh, two individuals here to scout things out. They, the two people that came examined the situation and said, they wrote back home and said, don't send anybody. But by the, <coughs> this is a wilderness, and this is not going to be good. And so, uh, but they're, by the time they got the letter, they'd already... Uh, started signing people up. Um, one thing that did happen from that, the initial two people, they recognized the need for food for this big population of people they were sending over. So they bought land around LaGrange and that became the Nassau Plantation. And they raised corn and other crops um, for food stock for this immigration group that was coming. <clears throat> Prince Solmes was the first general counsel for the Adelsverein in the Republic of Texas. Prince Solmes came, 
uh, he was a princely person. He had an entourage of people that took care of him. Um, but he was uh, recognized the difficulties that were going to happen with all these immigrants as they came. Uh, by the time he had a chance to assess things, they were already arriving. Uh, the, the groups were, began arriving in 1845. They came through the port of Galveston. Uh, then they were put on smaller ships and sent to a place on Matagorda Bay called Indian Point, or Indianola as we know it now. And it was it, <clears throat> they got there in the fall of 1845, in 1844, and, and, and as they came, it was raining. That is very low land there, lots of mosquitoes, lots of disease. Uh, the immigrants that arrived there, the first groups, had no place to stay. There were no tents. They, they had to put up tents. Um, mosquitoes were terrible, the snakes were bad, and many of them died of cholera, yellow fever, malaria, uh, and just uh, it was a deplorable situation. One of the other problems was that at that time, transportation was supposed to have been arranged. Uh, they were supposed to have wagons, but no wagons appeared. So these people basically had to start walking north and <clears throat> to get to their first destination which was going to be New Braunfels. They were sent to New Braunfels as a way station before they got to their land grant area. Uh, Prince Solmes had recognized that it was a long way, approximately 350 miles from the coast to their land grant area and because of the difficulties had purchased the land that became New Braunfels. So they were sent to New Braunfels. And the trail from um, Indianola to New Braunfels was littered with many corpses. There were lots of people that died on the way up and it was, a, it was really a very difficult time for them. As more and more people arrived in New Braunfels, uh, it was difficult to deal with the the numbers that were coming in. Prince Soames had not been a very good business person, had not kept track of all the things that were being purchased in his name and in the name of the Adelsverein, and he <coughs> recognized the, the tremendous difficulties. So he wrote home and said, I, I've had enough of this, I can't do this, I'm coming back. Uh, find somebody else. <coughs> and uh, the Adelsverein hired a person to come and take um, his place, and that person, um, that person was uh, uh, Baron von Moisebach. And Baron von Moisebach was a very principled and very intelligent man. He was 36 years old, <clears throat> and at the time he was a lawyer. He was the equivalent of an appellate court judge in Berlin and in Potsdam. His father was what would be a Supreme Court Justice. They were from a very um, well-known family. They were well-educated. His father had a huge library. In 1845, he had 35,000 volume library, and by the way, the library still exists. It's in a museum in, in Berlin today. Uh, <clears throat> he was a very seasoned lawyer. He was also, he had gotten degrees in mathematics and in forestry and uh, geology, among other things. So he was a very well-educated man, and he had read many of the publications about the Republic of Texas and was interested in coming to America. So he took the job, came over, and <clears throat> he was supposed to meet um, Prince Soames in New Braunfels. So he arrives in Galveston, he speaks to the administrator for the Adelsrein in Galveston, and uh, he tells him, uh, you better hurry, because uh, I think Prince Soames is uh, getting ready to leave. 
So Moise Bach uh, makes it to Indianola, sees the terrible situation of those that are still on the coast, and rides to New Braunfels. Gets to New Braunfels, where is Prince Solmes? Uh, he's gone to Galveston. He <clears throat> gets back on his horse the next day and rides back to Galveston. But he shouldn't have hurried because Prince Soames was in the <clears throat> being retained because the creditors were after him. <laughs> and unfortunately, Moise Bach had to use most of the credit, that, the money that he had to uh, bail Prince Soames out of the clink and get him uh, sent back to Germany with the stipulation that he was to go to the Adels Rhine and explain the situation and to say we need more funds because we're we don't have enough money. Uh, Moise Bach is uh, left with uh, trying to deal with this large population of people who are coming over. Uh, they are on ships, they're on their way, they're arriving in Indianola, they're making their way to New Braunfels and what to do about this. So he, in an attempt to uh, satisfy the land grant that these people had been promised, he, <clears throat> first of all, he goes out and actually looks at the land grant area. Prince Soames had not done that. So John, uh, and Moise Bach was, did not think that in America we needed any titles. And so when he, left Germany or Prussia to come to uh, Texas, he changed his name, I'm John O. Moisebach. I'm just John. And so uh, Moisebach then goes, rides out to look at the land grant area. The land grant is um, when he rides across the Llano River at about Castell, somewhere around that area, if you're familiar with the geography out there. Uh, he discovers that the land grant area <clears throat> already kind of has people living there <clears throat> called Comanche Indians. And they weren't interested in too many neighbors. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, so Moise Bach gets a sense of what this problem really is as he rides back towards New Braunfels. He comes across the hills and looks down into the Perdinalis River Valley and says, okay, this looks like a pretty good spot. Let me see if I can buy some land here. Buys 10,000 acres, sends the surveyors up, and they survey what is now Fredericksburg. Now, the town <coughs> was surveyed in, in uh, January of 1846, and in uh, April, he tells the group, uh, I think it's time to move on to decompress New Braunfels and I have this new place called Fredericksburg and we're going to take 123 of you up there and they begin to walk and they walk from New Braunfels to what is now Fredericksburg and arrived on May the 6th 1846. So that's kind of how the people arrived at what is now Fredericksburg. It's important to note that these people First of all, the, these immigrants that were coming were people who were highly educated. They were, there were some craftsmen, but most of the people were educated people. Uh, they were musicians, they were people who um, were doctors, and some were teachers, and a lot of different professions. Um, <clears throat> they, they were very interested in education. They were very interested in freedom of religion and freedom of speech. And so this was a great place. But instead of getting 640 acres, they got a lot in a town that didn't exist that was 100 by 200 feet. That was what they got. They also got a plot of land in a garden that was um, supposed to be 10 acres, and, and some of it was arable land and could be gardened, much of it was not. So it was a very difficult time. But these were people who were coming for a new life. Many of them had no means to get back home again. A few did, but very few left and went home. 
So they had to make it on, in this somewhat inhospitable um, frontier area. And they were, they were able to do that for a variety of interesting reasons. <clears throat> First of all, the settlement of Fredericksburg is kind of on a trail leading west. And the trail, the Palo Pinto Trail, uh, goes west to El Paso and then to, to California. And so it, it was, of course, right at the time that gold was found out in California. And so we suddenly had a group of people heading west coming through town. Many of the people became merchants. They had stores. They had saloons. Um, they did all kinds of things to provide for the people moving through town. So that was the first way in which the early immigrants managed to survive in town, in this community that was uh, carved out of nothing. Um, so <clears throat> a, the next thing that happened was the, because of Texas's entry into the United States in 18, at the end of 1845, this was now a state that they had, they had reckoned that they were coming to the Republic of Texas. They get here and it's now the state of Texas. And the U.S. Army comes and builds a fort on the outskirts of Fredericksburg. And the fort gives them jobs. Uh, they sell their produce to the fort and the soldiers at the fort come and spend money in their stores. So those are the kind of economic things that allowed the town to survive in a situation where they might not otherwise have survived. <clears throat> Over the next few years, uh, the people began to look around at the si outside of the town and began to move out to build their homes in the rural parts of the county. It became Gillespie County not too long after they got there. And as they did that, they took with them their desire for education. These were educated people. They wanted their children educated. One of the stipulations in the, in the contracts that they had signed was that the Adams Line was supposed to provide for them public education. <clears throat> One of the first buildings that was constructed in Fredericksburg was the Rheinskirche, which is an octagonal coffee grinder looking building that was placed in the middle of Main Street. And that served as the church, as the school, as the community center. So that idea of education was carried out into the, into the countryside. One of the, just a sidebar note, um, John Moisebach is credited with creating a treaty between the Indians and the settlers that has never been broken. It was a peace treaty. They, he went out, met with the chiefs, and said, here's a bunch of gifts. He gave them $3,000 worth of gifts, which in those years was a lot of stuff. And <clears throat> the Indians agreed not to attack the town and never did. And they were given, they could come into town and, and uh, they would be fed and they would trade and, and they had no problems in Fredericksburg. Now that did not go outside of town. Uh, when they were, when the people began to move out into the countryside, they did have problems with the Comanches raiding the, the farms and ranches. But nevertheless, they did survive and move out. And as they did, they began to create homeschooling and then the one-room country schools. <clears throat> the country schools began, the first one we think was the Luckenbach School. And the Luckenbach School was in 1855. We know that that's when the building was constructed, the first part of the, of the country school. And that was the first one that was done. But as the people moved out into the county 
uh, little groups of people would have uh, kids that would go, go to the homeschool, and then as they got enough in the homeschools, they'd begin to put together um, some plan for a school building. Someone would donate land, somebody else would donate timber, somebody else would donate other supplies, and everybody would come together and they would build the country school. They would hire a teacher, and they had one teacher for first through sixth, seventh, and then eighth grade. So there was one teacher for all the children, no matter what, whether they're first or the, through the eighth grade. Um, <clears throat> the Germans, very practical people. Um, they didn't think their kids should have to walk more than eight miles to school. <laughs> and so we eventually had 42 country schools in Gillespie County, 42 independent school districts in Gillespie County. Now, they had lots of interesting programs. The country schools, um, the, the children had basically a classic education. They not only were taught English, German, but they were taught Latin and in many cases, Greek. So the kids had an amazing education. We happen to have all of the records. We have all the curriculum. We, in many cases, have all the textbooks that were used. And it's amazing to look and see what these students were being taught. One of the things that they did in an effort to make sure that the students had gotten a proper education was at the end of school, the teachers would swap schools and test the students. So it was a way to check to see if the teachers were doing their job. So they would rotate and test the students. And <clears throat> they would put on plays. That was the, there were two seasons of the year when the kids performed for the parents. One was at Christmas, they put on a Christmas play and one was at the end of school, and they would put on some other kind of play. And many of the plays were very complicated plays. They weren't simple things, but the kids would work hard to memorize all of their material and put on these plays. In later years, <clears throat> all of the schools had pavilions where these plays took place. One of the interesting things is, and I'll show you a few pictures, <clears throat> the, the schools had curtains. Uh, if, if you've been around any of country schools in the past, you may or may not have heard of these country school curtains. I originally thought it was unique to our Gillespie County country schools, but subsequently I've discovered that there was a whole industry that produced these curtains that were used on the stages. The ones in Gillespie County are supposed to be hill country scenes. I haven't seen too many snow-capped mountains in the hill country, but <clears throat> they, they're, um, they took a little liberty at, their, at the hill country. But nevertheless, there's a scene, and then around the border of the, of the curtain, are advertisements, and that's how you paid for the curtain, was you sold advertisements. And we have some great pictures of, of some of these curtains, and we have preserved a number of the curtains uh, because they are quite unique. The uh, students, as I said, had a very rigorous education, and <clears throat> the schools flourished. The children did well. Uh, looking at all the records that we have and seeing what these students did, many of them went on to uh, do many interesting things. They became doctors and lawyers and teachers of various sorts. Um, and uh, it's, it's truly amazing because all of the records have been preserved. And we have recently gone through and, and uh, digitized some of these records and created some documents that will help us to preserve this group of, of or this group of information on this group of people. And at any rate, everything worked fine. The schools rocked along until 1949. 
And the state legislature, in its wisdom, decided that the students in rural Texas weren't getting a very good education, and so they passed the gilmer aiken Law, which was the consolidation of the country's schools. Um, <clears throat> and when that happened, the, many of the schools began to close as the kids were ferried into Fredericksburg for their education. Uh, but the schools remained an important focal point for the community. And it's all about community. The country schools were the focus of these small groups of communities around our county. The community clubs that occurred in the schools or associated with the schools first went to the school district and worked out leases so they could continue to use the facilities. Now these were primitive facilities. Electricity didn't come to most of these schools until after World War II. None of the schools had wells. They all used cistern water. Um, none of the schools had anything but a big old potbelly stove for heating and you open the windows for cooling. Um, and in <clears throat> around the county, the schools were used by these community clubs. When the schools closed, some of these 44 or 42 school districts had provisions in the covenants when the land was deeded to the school district that they should revert the properties and any improvements would revert back to the donor. So some of the schools were lost by that mechanism at the time the schools were closed for educational purposes. But they can continue to be focal points for the, for the communities. Some of them were used as polling places. And so there was a lot of activity going on despite the fact that no education was taking place in these facilities. So then in 1999, the Fredericksburg Independent School District looked at this surplus property that they had and recognized that it had some economic value. And they were, like all districts, needing money. And so there was a consideration of selling these properties. And the community did not care for that idea. <clears throat> and it is, this is a great story about community and how individuals in a community actually can make a difference. What they discovered was that they could not go to the school district and just continue the leases that they previously had. Because the school district had recognized these as surplus properties, you could buy them at fair market value, you could lease them at fair market value, but you couldn't just be given those properties. They found out that it was a prohibition in the Constitution of the state of Texas. So, not to be deterred, and I have to say that a goodly portion of this group that formed the Friends organization to begin with were school teachers, active duty and retired school teachers. And they said, we are going to figure this out. So what they did was they went, uh, <clears throat> they first of all began to read about it and figured out what, what had to be done. And it turned out that the only solution to this problem was to change the Constitution of the state of Texas. And they said, hey, we can do this, <laughs> not to be deterred. So they did. They went to our state uh, representative and state senator, uh, Jeff Wentworth and, and Harvey Hildebrand, our representative, and they proposed this idea of a change in the Constitution. They passed that through the legislature, and then it was placed on the November ballot. And in 2002, they, they went all over the place with parade floats, talking on the radio, articles in newspapers, and overwhelmingly, in the November election, this proposition passed. So that allowed this group of people to preserve these community schools. Now, we have in Fredericksburg, in Gillespie County, 
we have the largest single group of one-room country schools anywhere in America. <clears throat> All of these schools um, now, and, and this is a total of 65 acres, and there are about 32 to 36 structures on these properties. So they have significant value. But the, what was done was with the change in the Constitution, the independent school district could transfer surplus properties to the county, and then the county could lease them to the 501c3 tax exempt organization. So that was the primary goal of this whole operation was to do that. Now once that happened, the Friends organization, and I have to say that there were probably around five to six hundred people that were actively participating in the Friends organization at the time to get this, to get this changed. Now, <clears throat> the organization was then faced with, we've got them, but we have to do preservation and restoration. All of these structures are over a hundred years old. Many of them had had very little maintenance in 25, 30 years, so there was a lot to be done. So what was done was we developed a strategic architectural and uh, use program for each one of the schools. We looked at each school to decide what is the most important thing to do with these historic structures. They're all registered as historic sites on the National Registry. They are all, some of them are part of the Texas Historical Commission and have a historical marker and are historic sites and that from the Texas Historical Commission. So having developed this, the group then began the process of trying to do the restoration, preservation. Well, immediately the problem was money because all of this takes a lot of money. Many of the group had ideas of how this might be done. Um, we had lots of fundraisers, lots of barbecues, so lots of cupcakes and, and cookies, but you know, that doesn't bring in the kind of money you need for 12 schools and all these different structures and the things that had to be done, roofs, and, and everything. One of the things that uh, I will show you in other pictures is that because no wells were present, and a well, you know, any of you who have lived in the country know that wells are not cheap, and out in the hill country where sometimes you have to drill a long ways to get water, they're really not cheap. But two of our drilling companies in the community stepped up divided the schools, each took six schools, and drilled the wells. So that we began to have a lot of community involvement. And the community provided a lot of support in various ways. Verdell Drilling and uh, l, &L Drilling uh, were very unique companies that provided a significant amount of uh, activity. The Pecan Creek School was one. This is uh, the, the Lower South Grape Creek and the women and men and women at the Lower South Grape Creek School were really instrumental in the formation of the Friends organization. <clears throat> the Lower South Grape Creek is a school that was part of the Lukenbach School to begin with. And as people moved along the Lower South Grape Creek and advanced further toward what is now 290, they had several different school buildings that were constructed. This particular one is the, is the current building and it's on 290 East out of uh, Fredericksburg, right across from the 4.0 uh, Cellars uh, Winery. Uh, if you happen to be a wine person, well, that's a marker. Uh, but um, it, it is a, a very well-preserved school. Uh, that's another picture of the school, and it is uh, now, this is a recent picture. It shows its new roof, and it's painted, 
the inner interior has been well preserved. Uh, Moiseybach Creek, the Moiseybach Creek School has an interesting history. This particular building is an 1897 structure. Uh, Moiseybach Creek is interesting for a variety of reasons. It's out to the south of Fredericksburg on Moiseybach Creek and it is a school that was integrated long before that was an issue. Uh, we had an interesting, the, the Fredericksburg area and uh, Gillespie County uh, and the surrounding counties are unique because when the Civil War arrived, these recent immigrants wanted to have nothing to do with it. And they are, when the referendum occurred in Texas to secede from the Union, Gillespie County voted 437 to 7 or 17, something like that, to not secede. And there were only a handful of counties around the state that voted not to secede. So Gillespie County's people um, were, had a lot of problems during the Civil War, shall we say. One of the sad stories is that because they were not interested in participating, uh, the Confederate Army um, sent troops and they gathered people up that would not swear allegiance to the Confederacy and hung them on the trees. And uh, it was a very sad time. A group of people were told that the governor would let them go if they, would, if they didn't want to do this. They had 30 days and they could leave. And so they took that at his word, or at least they thought it was his word. And so they gathered together a group of about 65 people to head off. They were planning to head to <coughs> join the Union forces. And they were going to do this by going into Mexico and then through Veracruz and back into the, um, to the northern states. Well, what happened, of course, is they were caught as they were camped out on the Nueces River and they were massacred. And most of them died. A few survived and they got to the Rio Grande where they were caught again and only a handful made it into Mexico. And the footnote to the story is they managed to get to Veracruz, managed to go to New Orleans, joined the Union forces, were stationed in Brownsville and participated in the last battle of the Civil War, which was after the Civil War was over. Guess who won that battle? The Confederates. And they were put in jail. So these people suffered a lot during the Civil War. And some of those wounds have only recently finally kind of healed. So it's, um, it's an interesting story. But Moiseybach Creek had a number of African Americans who went to school with everybody else. And no one was cared. That was okay. That's the school today. Um, it's currently having a new paint job done and they have a new roof and the inner interior has been restored. And there it is, another view. This is the Pecan Creek School. Pecan Creek School is located to the west of Fredericksburg and north. Pecan Creek School <clears throat> is out in a really rural area that is that is uh, served um, has served this community very well. But when it was acquired by the Friends organization, it needed a lot of work. And I'm going to show you what happens when a group of people come together to do a project. And this is just an example of, of what was done. The new roof, uh, we got grant money of $4,200 and the people raised $3,574 to do the roof. So together with the grant monies, they were able to put a new roof on the building. You might ask, where did we get the grant money? Well, in our community, um, 
we have LCRA provides electricity to the community. LCRA has community grants, so that's one source of funding. Another source is the hotel occupancy tax funds. The hotel occupancy tax funding, um, the law is very specific on how that money can be spent. It's primarily collected from tourists and it's primarily used to advertise your community to bring more tourists. That's the goal. But also in that, grant, in that law it says that the monies can be used for historical preservation and restoration. Thank you.